Sintra, Portugal considered to be one of the most beautiful and picturesque locations in Europe. Visited by millions every year who are drawn to the ancient marbles and sites located within the shadow of the eternally misbound Mountain of the Moon. A landscape where even the most superficial bucket list type of tourist is soon made aware of forces which emanate from and around the location of Sintra and within its buildings, stones and woodland covered vistas. The same unseen forces which unknowingly draw in the habitual tourist have also drawn in the past the shaman, the druid and the mystic. There is a reason why Sintra generates and attracts these forces. The mist that forever swirls through the Cyclopean archaeological and geographic landscape is a very real veil between this world and other states of being. Everyone from the ancient Celts to the Moors to the Knights Templars and the Freemasons have known of Sintra's mystical energies as well as its powerful secrets. Why have people such as Lord Byron to Alistair Crowley fallen under the spell of Sintra? This film will, for the first time, reveal the true nature and magical secrets of Sintra at last. The gateway and home to ancient gods. Ancient gods who are waiting for the time when their names and powers are invoked by all once again. This is the Sintra Code. Imagine that the collection and safeguarding of ancient culture and life was not merely connected to material objects alone. We have created museums to store the items of the past so our eyes today can gaze upon them. Now also consider this idea being extended towards spiritual and magical forces not merely in the form of an ancient or crumbling temple or other religious structure from the past from which ancient gods and goddesses were evoked but instead an actual landscape which is understood to be a place of significant ancient spiritual forces a magical living sanctuary a place whereby the spiritual forces and archetypes of the ancient past are waiting for the time when they are once again to return to the human consciousness as a whole. We see this idea on a small scale all over Europe. Holy wells and other similar occasions being considered sanctuaries for the old gods and goddesses. The pagan world and the pagan spiritual and magic tradition being held alive in these specific and isolated locations. Sintra on the other hand is much much more. It is a spiritual preserve for the protection of pagan gods and goddesses of old as well as magical forces. These magical forces are not only expressed within the natural landscape, but also within specific buildings designed for that purpose. The millions of visitors who visit the region each year 
and also wonder at the strangeness of its intriguing buildings, are also unknowingly taking a piece of these ancient spiritual forces back with them into the modern religious and secular world, carrying away with them these spiritual and magical forces as something akin to seeds which will eventually germinate into the return of these ancient archetypes once more. Powerful groups and individuals who have in the past controlled the landscape of Sintra firstly sought to harness the power of its natural forces, its ancient groves, its mysterious rock forms, as well as the running water creating a natural repository of what is known as the alchemical dew. The ancient Celts and the pagan Romans, and then eventually Christianity and Islam, all attempted and to a degree harnessed the magical forces of Sintra. Only for one man, a mystical visionary named Antonio Augusto Carvalho Monteiro, who understood the full power of the Sintra landscape. He went on to create a sanctuary and playground for the ancient gods and archetypes within his magnificent Quinta da Rigeliera. These stunning landscape gardens perfectly complemented the magical sense of wonder already contained within the natural forms and landscape of the Sintra Mountains. However, Quinta da Rigeliera was to be a place where humans and ancient pagan gods were to once again encounter one another among the groves, caves and ancient stones as their ancestors once did, to partake in the company of Pan, Polo, Diana, the Green Man and more ancient Celtic gods such as Lu. This was the purpose of Quinta da Rigeliera. An infrastructure to power and charge these archetypes while also creating a tangible mystery school of wonder, veneration and initiation. Before we look deeply into, as well as unravel, the esoteric codes of Carvalho's Monteiro's Quinta da Regalia, it is important that we understand why in Sintra of all places. For as long as humans have encountered the mountain of the moon at Sintra, they have known that this was indeed a gateway of the gods as well as a portal into other worlds. The city of Sintra itself is located among the Sintra mountains, or the Sierra de Sintra in western Portugal, with all of its peaks under 600 meters in height. The range covers about 16 kilometers 
from the city of Sintra to where the mountains eventually meet the Atlantic Ocean. The dominant mountain over the city of Sintra, and which became, in Latin, Lune Mons. The Romans themselves, in turn, were soon to rename the location after the goddess Diana of the Hunt, which to the Romans was called Cynthia, and hence eventually became the Sintra of today. The goddess Diana, or Cynthia, is also the goddess of the moon, the goddess of the oak, and she is an archetype whose veneration is determined by the creation and the protection of ritualistic landscapes and wild spiritual sanctuaries. Prior to the Celts, the Sintra mountain range was home to the same Neolithic culture which is found all over Portugal and throughout the megalithic arc of Western Europe as a whole. These people were also quick to realise the power of Sintra and along with the erection of standing stones they also tunnelled ritualistic caves deep into the mountain. This example here has been incorrectly identified as being Moorish in origin, as they are located below the Moorish castle itself. As these types of ritual chambers and tunnels are found carved into rock all over Iberia and all dating from the Neolithic era, we can safely assume that these are also from the same antiquity. The fact that these are called Moorish is also a telling insight into how both Christianity and later Islam have both attempted to co-opt the power of Sintra and claim all within the shadow of the mountain of the moon as their own. Due to the higher rainfall, the Sintra Mountains have a unique and rich ecosystem supporting the growth of plants which are suited to the environment. Indeed, this is a very alchemical landscape. The entire region is particularly suited to the growth of indigenous woodlands and in particular the sacred oak of the pagans, principally the Celts, whose druids performed their ceremonies within these sacred groves as they did all over Celtic Europe. The environmental landscape of Sintra is perfectly suited towards the gestation of spiritual forces and archetypes. Local folklore, as is common with such locations, is resplendent with tales of supernatural beings within the location and various supernatural and mystical forces. The ecological richness and diversity of the Sintra mountains gave rise to the human occupation which goes back to the very early Paleolithic era when the first humans arrived in the region. This in turn would eventually give rise to the rich and active Neolithic cultures of Sintra which left traces of their occupation in and around the most prominent archaeological sites such as the Moorish Castle.
It was during the Moorish occupation of Sintra that the geographer al Bakar described high areas above the town as being permanently submersed in a fog that never dissipates. The Moors set about building a formidable citadel which wrapped around the summit of the mountain like a stone crown in an ocean of drifting mist. The large tower of the castle only added to the overall mystique and ethereal energies of the location. Even today, ascending into one of the highest towers feels like entering another domain, as often the towers appear to float at times above the mist below them, eventually moving to reveal the elevated heights upon which the castle stands. The mist itself carries the alchemical dew, which feeds the moss-covered stones of the castle, as the plant acts like a giant sponge harnessing the water of the heavens and soaking it into the fabric of the mounting. This meandering and all-encompassing moss being the transmutative conduit between sky and stone. It is no surprise that when the Crusaders took the castle on the highly occultic date of April 30th, 1093, that the Knights Templars soon recognized the spiritual and magical potential of the location. In fact, it is hard to imagine a place more suited to the Knights Templar than the entire region of Sintra, with its myriad of subterranean cave networks, access to the ocean, and defensive capabilities. Sintra and its secrets are both visible and invisible at the same time. One of the more telling traces of the Templar's connection to Sintra is the converted Fatima Mosque within the Moorish castle itself, which was eventually converted into a tower and contains below it the bones of both Christian and Muslim knights all buried together buried together as if to imply their sacrifice to their respective interpretations of Jehovah was irrelevant as the universe is controlled by other forces known to the Templars The site is marked out by a rather telling skull and crossbones carved motif where there once stood a crucifix and a crescent which has been removed in recent years for reasons unknown. Only the insignia of the Knights Templars remains. In many ways, the Knights Templars never left Sintra, but rather laid out the esoteric foundation stone upon which the later magical incarnations of Sintra were to be built upon. The cross of the Templars representing an esoteric crossroads between the pagan past and a clandestine compromise under the jurisdiction of Christianity. The old gods and goddesses retreated from the groves and cliff faces of the Sintra mountains and into the hearts and souls of men, men within secret orders and hushed incantations.
Located near the historic center of Sintra lies the Quinta da Regaliera that combines Gothic, Egyptian, Moorish and Renaissance features and which once belonged to an aristocratic family from Porto in the north of the country. The many thousands of visitors to the location every year wonder and marvel at the strangeness and whimsicality of the buildings and its structures within the beautiful and ornate grounds. Along with wells devoid of water and towers that serve no purpose, including an aquarium without fish, there are endless walkways, bridges and other elements which harken back to the ancient world of prehistory. Quinta da Regaliera is as much a map of the subconscious mind of humans as it is a landscape of wonder and magic. This is a landscape where the gods and goddesses of the ancient world were to roam free and was intended as such and which indeed to any sensitive visitor it becomes apparent that they still do. From shamanism to Freemasonry Quinta da Regaliera was designed as in order to alter the psyche of all who encounters its profound mysteries. Carvalho Monteiro purchased the Quinta da Regaliera estate on December 11th, 1893, and construction on his esoteric gardens commenced in early 1904, and which was fully completed by 1918. During this time frame, the already existing estate was reimagined into a unique place, that being a palace and gardens adorned with symbolic carvings associated with Freemasonry, the Tarot, the Knights Templar and Rosicrucianism. Carvalho Monteiro was hardly a man unaccustomed to the esoteric life. He was closely connected with Isabella de Figueiredo, who wrote a Portuguese secret doctrine long before Helena Blavatsky. The book itself was extremely influential not only within Portuguese esoteric and spiritual circles, but also within academic and aristocratic circles of the era. At the time of the development and construction of Quinta da Regaliera, Theosophy and Spiritualism had taken a firm grip within the upper echelons of Portuguese society as it had done so all over the Western world. so as not to run afoul of the Catholic clergy. Very often the more outwardly expressions of this interest, such as the constructions at Quinta da Regaliera, was often placed under the umbrella, officially, of esoteric Christianity, although it was nothing of the sort. This was simply a cover story to keep the ecumenical dogs at bay. It's also worth noting that this was a period of profound change within Portuguese society. Something of a spiritual and secular uprising had taken place against the Catholic Church in Portugal, along with its connection toward the previous monarchy. Portugal at the time was a macrocosm of Quinta da Regaliera, in that the pagan soul struggled to come to the surface alongside more pragmatic and political ideas of revolution and social change. Social change that was also expressed within the strange events that took place in 1917 at Fatima.
In many ways, what was being outlined and attempted at places such as Quinta da Regaliera and also within Portuguese spiritualist and esoteric circles was the development of a religion of the future. A means of creating a perfected man by tapping into the soul of man which resided in the layers below that of the Christian and to free them once again within a modern spiritual context. The New Age long before the New Age came into being as we understand it today. This was a striving towards a hybrid of European paganism coupled with the wider esoteric and magical traditions of the West which became the foundation stones of this particular school of esoteric exploration and rejuvenation. The tarot was seen as being integral to this, as along with its mysterious origins, the universal archetypes within this spiritual hybridization appears throughout the 22 cards of the major arcana. The hanged man being Odin, the lightning bolt which strikes the tower being Lucifer or Thor, death being considered as the goddess of death as in the Vedic Kali or the Northern Valkyries, and the chariot being a homage to the wider Indo-European spiritual foundations found elsewhere, from the Bhagavad Gita to the Irish mythological cycle. Haro was thus considered a template upon this new religion to replace Christianity and how it was to be understood and expressed. Quinta da Regaliera was to incorporate the fool's journey into its very forms and symbolism so as to transform the visitor into a step closer to this new spiritual human of the post-Christian age. The primary purpose of Quinta da Regaliera was to firstly provide a sanctuary for the pagan gods of old then to venerate them in rituals and in stone and finally to reinvoke them from the dormant archetypes within modern humans in order to restore them within the spiritual dynamism of the western consciousness. Quinta da Regaliera was not just for Portugal, it was designed to liberate and renew the entire western spiritual consciousness. We also cannot detach from the fact that towards the end of the completion of Quinta da Regaliera in 1918, the world famous Fatima events also took place in Portugal. It is most certainly worth speculating if the construction of Quinta da Regaliera actually played a role in charging the Portuguese psyche in such a way that it opened a portal which manifested to the north of Sintra in Fatima. The Fatima events themselves were in reality nothing like the official Jesuit story created in the 1940s and were far more mysterious and fortean in nature than a mere vision of the Virgin Mary appearing to three peasant children.
Calvalho Monteiro must have indeed pondered the relationship between his own works at Sintra and what was taking place at Fatima, as he had giant boulders repositioned to simulate the ancient dolmens of the Neolithic world, as well as to construct secret grottos of his own as gateways to the old gods. With the events at Fatima taking place towards the completion of Quinta de Regaliera, along with the fact that the Fatima events were predicted by magical circles in both Lisbon and Porto, and which they announced correctly in local newspapers before the actual miracle of the sun came to pass. It would not be beyond the bounds of wild speculation to suggest that the activation of Quinta de Regaliera played some part in the Fatima phenomena. Although the complexity and full meaning behind Quinta de Regaliera is both wide-reaching and immense and would represent an undertaking of a magnitude beyond the limitations of this documentary, we shall focus our intentions specifically upon two highly significant elements within Carvalho Monteiro's ritualistic gardens. The primary purpose of magic and sorcery is to alter the subatomic fabric of reality and how we experience the material world as a more active rather than passive state. To use the modern term of hacking the matrix or to make reality somewhat optional. One of the main tools for the quantification of ongoing magical process is the recognizing of synchronicities as a method of testing any desire of the magician as reality alters in the aftermath of, or indeed during, the magical ritual or endeavour. We have already seen how, in the case of the construction of Cuinta da Regaliera, how the Fatima apparition unfolded during the construction of Calvalho Monteiro's ritualistic landscape. During this same period, the British magician and artist Austin Osmond Spare was developing the fundamentals of what we would come to know as being chaos magic when the idea was brought to fruition in the 1970s. Spare was performing on canvas and with oil paint what Carvalho Monteiro was undertaking at Puyenta da Regaliera by utilizing the same underlying processes and towards similar objectives. None other than the great B666 himself Alistair Crowley, yes that guy again, the man who invented the world we live in today would later pay a visit to Portugal and in particular Sintra as something of a magical homage or pilgrimage to the occultic legacies of that country. If there is one element within a magical landscape 
of Quinta da Regaliera that is known to many people around the world. It is a beautiful and remarkable main initiation well. Of all the structures within that landscape, it remains the one that creates the most profound sense of mystery within the visitor. And so it should. Its beauty and its engineering are breathtaking to behold, as is the sense of mystery and wonder the structure generates. In many ways, this initiation well can be seen as something of a passive murder hole of the psyche, where initiates were symbolically thrown into in order to have them reborn once again. A slaughter of the complexities of their ego in order to unleash the dormant or repressed aspects of their psyche, in much the same way shamanism does the same thing. To get oneself out of the way of oneself by means of purposeful and deliberate invoked trauma, so as to create something of an absolute focus which is needed to enter into the required altered states of consciousness for the next stage of the initiation. This traumatic gnosis that is required to wipe the slate clean within the ego and psyche of the initiate, and from this create a blank canvas for them to begin again, is their path to the superior man. Guided by the subconscious forces and archetypes within them, rather than the everyday exterior forces which impact upon them. From the moss-covered stonework harvesting the alchemical dew, which drips towards the bottom of the circle, to the arched windows which spiral perfectly into the seemingly bottomless abyss, the initiation well's design and engineering brilliance is a marvel to behold. And this is why it was called the initiation well. The adepts were initiated and their psychic energy is retained within the bottom of the well as a repository of their psychic force. This same energy is also what causes many people to become silent and introspective as soon as they set foot onto the base of the well by means of access from the lower cave systems. The well has a 27 meter spiral staircase directly connected to the mysteries of the tarot and in particular one significant card were in the major arcana. Much speculation over the years has been given to the actual relationship between the inverted tower of the initiation well and how it is connected to the tarot and I believe I have discovered how and why the well was used to initiate the fools who were brought into the Quinta da Regaliera for ceremonial rites. At the top of the tower is presently a copper light bracket which extends from a significant deep cut into the supporting rock. The opening was designed for a much much larger and heavier bracket to support a far more considerable weight. The weight of an inverted hanged man.
The hanged man card within the tarot represents attainment of enlightenment by looking within, as well as seeing the world differently by means of employing suffering and terror. The hanged man is based on the archetype of the Norse god Odin being suspended from the Yggdrasil world tree of life. I have come to believe that the initiation at the inverted well of Quinta da Regaliera involved a willing fool being led blindfolded up through the path. After being allowed to see the Cyclopean megalith surrounding it, creating a deceptive facade which masks the remarkable experience that they would soon undergo once the blindfold was removed and they were suspended from the overhanging bracket. Once at the top and suspended by the feet from a rope on a pulley hanging above the initiation well. Upon removing the adept's blindfold, to their terror would find themselves looking down into the spiraling abyss below. Overcome with surprise, terror and loathing, even awe and amazement, the fool, now in the aspect of the hanged man, would then be slowly lowered down towards the bottom surface of the well, passing the previous Grand Masters and other initiated members of the secret society who would eventually congratulate the reborn member upon reaching the lower surface. They would be then sworn to secrecy, never to tell anyone else of their initiation and what it had entailed. The purpose of the ritual was one of shock and terror, to stare one's potential oblivion in the face, to peer in terror into the deep well, as a symbol of staring into their own psyche, to see themselves and the world differently than they had done so before the initiation to cleanse themselves at the subconscious level of their symbolic death and rebirth the experience would generate within them. To place their trust and loyalty within the ethos of the secret society at Quienta da Regaliera. The architect hired to design Quienta da Regaliera was an Italian aristocrat and theatrical set designer by the name of Luigi Manini. A high-ranking Lombardian Freemason, he was the perfect man suited for the task of designing this esoteric landscape. Along with being a homage to the seven levels of hell as described within Dante's Divine Comedy, the nine levels of the initiation well also directly relate to the theosophical nine states or tattvas of the physical plane according to the notion of states of matter, which itself is derived from the Gnostic cosmological concepts of the seven and nine hells. Each of the nine levels or hell gates has 15 steps leading to a landing or viewing platform. If we apply classical numerology to this, we find that 9 multiplied by 15 equals 135, which resolves itself into 1 plus 3 plus 5, giving us 9. Once more, further insight into the complexity and esoteric specifics of the engineering and design behind the creation of this initiation well. The psychic intensity of the initiation well, even today, despite having been visited by thousands of tourists, is still extremely potent. Its potency was designed to last, so as to seep within the consciousness of all who set foot in the lower levels of the well, 
and who stare upwards towards a circular opening to the heavens above. While I was filming the initiation well for this documentary, my camera began to act strangely and took images of what appears to be a swirling upwards moving light or energy force of some kind. The camera worked perfectly well before and after and only took images of this strange anomaly while I was at the base of the initiation well where the absolute focus of all psychic energy would have been held like a reservoir. I made no changes to the camera settings. At this moment I was overcome by a sense of slight electromagnetic fluctuations and tingling. The forces within the initiation well at Quienta da Regaliera remain as vital and as potent as ever. Upon the fool's release, at the base of the initiation well, they would then make their way through the subterranean tunnel system and eventually emerge at what is known as the Portal of the Guardians. The portal of the Guardians itself is one of the most graceful and elegant structures at Quinta da Regaliera, and which stands a large pavilion flanked by two towers, while the pavilion ahead of it is also flanked by two very significant and important towers. Clearly, this is a representation of the moon card in the tarot and is indicative of the Fool's next phase. Having been made aware of the secrets of the Quinta da Regaliera secret society, the initiate or Fool has to now carry the burden of this secret knowledge for the rest of his life. His spiritual growth is dependent upon the dark secrets held within him, which he must never disclose to anyone. Facing the landscape of the moon card, his fortitude and loyalty to the secret society will now be tested for the rest of his life. Behind him are the two aquatic creatures to remind the fool of the subconscious forces which will arise from his new status. These will manifest over the course of his life in terms of dreams, phobias and nightmares, but they are not without purpose. They manifest in order to create a guidance from the subconscious mind. Within the tarot card of the moon we see either a depiction of a crab or lobsters at the base of the card. Again, this represents subconscious forces of the psyche bringing up repressed memories and ancient codes which will help guide the fool along the dark night of the soul. In 1912 Alistair Crowley painted this remarkable landscape of the moon card elements long before he had yet to visit Sintra. Remarkably, it is an almost expressionist image of the portal of the guardians at Sintra. 
At the top of the painting we see the two towers flanking, the entire scene, found within all depictions of the moon card. The fountain in the centre of the portal of the guardians represents the ocean in man, as a repository of his deep thoughts and inclinations. From this point on, his task is to seek the Aqua Nostra, or the new waters, which will eventually prepare him for the highest levels of initiation when the time is right. Likewise, mirroring that which is seen on the moon card, on either side of the pavilion across from the portal of the guardians, are again two towers, not of equal height, and also of different designs. Their symbolism is that of both determining the parameters of the journey ahead and also to represent powerful help and opposition during the fool's journey along the dark night of the soul. The initiate having been relieved from the trauma of the hanged man at the initiation well at Quiente da Regaliera and emerging from the subterranean cave network would have looked upon this scene with profound resolve and determination. The character of the man that he is will be determined by how he carries the burden of secret knowledge contained within him. Quinta da Regaliera, like all of Sintra, is a wonderful landscape of astounding geological and biological beauty. And the ongoing sanctification of the location has ensured that the pagan gods and goddesses of old have been given a sanctuary among the hills and woodlands and within the caves and the grottos that the eternal mist which forever shrouds the mountain of the moon will remind all those who gaze upon it that there are worlds and experiences which exist beyond the domain of earthly drudgery. All it takes is for humans, either as individuals or eventually as a whole, to summon and invoke these forces back into the material world. If you would like to know more about the topics covered in this film, you can read my book, Sorcery, The Invocation of Strangeness, and visit my website, www.mossuponstones.com, at the link below.